So after the fall, all of human history and the sum of the spiritual choices that confront you and me in this brief life we live here on earth, uh, as we seek our daily bread, everybody, you know, needs to be fed. Water and food, that's what uh, Isaiah 55 is addressing, basic needs. We seek our daily bread, our future bread too. It's, it's all a tale of two kings, a tale of two houses, a tale of two cities. You have on the one side man's house, man's city, man's kingdoms, man-made security, significance, and future. Classic example early in the scripture, and it runs pretty much throughout scripture from Genesis, and it gets repeated all the way into Revelation. Babel. Babel, Babel. It means from the ancient Akkadian, heading over into Aramaic, gate of the gods, or gate to God. You know, that's what they're trying to build with that tower. Stairway to heaven, right? And the example of Babylon in Revelation, you get Jesus through John going back and forth. Rome, Babylon, they're the same. Let's go back to Genesis. Genesis 11, verse 4. This is on Babel. Uh, the people of Babel say, come, let us build ourselves. Did you catch that? They're going to build it themselves. Let us build ourselves a city. It's our city. And a tower with its head in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves. We'll make a name for ourselves. Lest we are dispersed over the earth. Now, contrast that with God's house. God's city. God's kingdom. God gives. Okay, we don't build it for ourselves. God gives his people who believe in him a name. A city. A house. A kingdom. And also our daily bread and our everlasting bread. You want bread that lasts into eternity? You better not go with the city of man. So let's look at Abraham. Right after you catch this, you got Babel in Genesis 11. Now let's go to Genesis 12. The Lord said to Abram, this is Abraham, go from your country, your kindred, and your father's house. I want you to leave your father's house. I'm going to give you a new house. It's going to belong to me. To the land I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great. Okay? The Babylonians are going to make their name. God says, Abraham, I want you to believe me now. Leave everything behind. I'm going, to get, I'm going to make your name. I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. By the way, be a great nation and father of many nations. Now let's go to the New Testament. We get the explanation from God's word further what's going on here. Hebrews 11. By faith... Abraham obeyed when he was called to go to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents. He didn't have a house. Living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs of the same promise. Why? Because he was looking forward to the city that has foundations whose designer and builder is God. You got a choice. Rome, New York, Babylon, whatever, Las Vegas, or God's city. Now, I tell you, I'll be honest with you, most of the crowd, most people, they flock like sheep to kings and politicians who promise them a better future and security and making things good. But contrast those kings and those presidents of those politicians with the Lord, whom David calls my shepherd. In other words, my king. David says, when I trust in him, I lack for nothing. He provides food to satisfy me fully. He rules me and guides me and protects me. Even in the face of death, I know he's with me. And I will live not in my house, but his house forever. So, to the New Testament. Uh, you remember good old Herod the first, right? Herod, otherwise known as the Great. When he died, according to the annals of Tacitus, uh, the Acta Diurna in Rome, 
the posting of kind of the daily news. This was the headline. Herod, friend of Romans, dead at 70. Herod, friend of Romans, dead at 70. Herod the Great, Herod, friend of Romans. And you know, just about three, three and a half miles outside of Bethlehem, he had one of his major palace fortress, what we would call kind of like a, a castle called the Herodium. Really interesting, just about three and a half miles outside of Bethlehem. So you get the classic contrast. Herod the Great with his palace, his fortress, celebrating his victory when he took power. And three and a half miles away, a baby nobody's ever heard of in those days laid in a manger. Which one are you going to go with? Herod's massive Herodian or Jesus' humble birthplace in Little Bethlehem? Now, what we just read from Luke 9, we're fast-forwarding to Herod the Great's son, his, his baby son, his youngest son, Antipas, who was one of the Tetrarchs, Herod the Tetrarch, who was, catch this now, here's where he grew up, here's where he was educated, Antipas, Herod the Tetrarch, grew up and educated in Rome, in the imperial palaces of Rome. Didn't get any higher than that in those days. And then you have little Bethlehem-born Jesus, raised as a Nazareth carpenter's son. That's the way he's educated. That's the way he's brought up. Imperial palaces in Rome, Nazareth carpenter shop. Remember the story of Christmas over in Matthew? King Herod said to the Magi, when you have found him, bring me word that I may come and worship him. I want to see him. I really do. Now fast forward to Luke chapter 9. His son, Herod Antipas. John I beheaded, but who is this about whom I hear such things? And he was seeking to see him. Yeah, he got to see John the Baptist too. I'm sure that's a really nice seeking that he's doing there. Jesus, God's son, Bethlehem born son of David, the king and son of Abraham, the friend of God who had faith in God. Okay, a little bit of education here. I do it with my children for chapel, so you gotta, you got to learn it too. What does Bethlehem mean? I've already given you the hints on this. Bethlehem, Bethlehem, what does it mean? House of what? Bread, yeah. So, there are two miracles. Talked about this last Sunday. Go back to last Sunday's sermon. It's a little more expositional, basic expositional. Today, I'm a little more fanciful moving around. Two miracles, though, recorded in all four Gospels. There's two, only two. Remember from last week? Jesus' resurrection and then his most massive public miracle at the climax of his Galilean period ministry, multiplying the bread and the fish to feed 5,000 plus. Because remember, it's a lot more than 5,000 probably. There's 5,000 men. You got women and children, and you got Jesus' own disciples who aren't included in the crowd. It's awesome. Now, remember what's going on here. The apostles have come back. He sent them out. They give their report. Jesus wants to take them for a retreat, but the retreat is interrupted by the crowds. The apostles are surely really upset and disappointed about this, but Jesus welcomes the crowds in teaching them all day long of the word of God and healing them. And then we have the day in dilemma. Uh, what are we going to do, Jesus? You keep preaching and it's starting to get dark. We need to send these people away. They give direction to Jesus, boss and Jesus, and Jesus gives direction to them. You, it's emphatic, you feed them. And then he tells them, look, have them sit down. Now, let's go back to this. In this story, I've given you Bethlehem. I'm going to give you one other one that you, you need to make the connection on. Of the four Gospels, all of which have this major miracle, John 6 really fills in a lot of blanks for us, gives us the little boy providing the bread and the fish. But of the four Gospels, only one mentions that Jesus is on his way to and apparently right outside in the desolate fields outside of a city, a town. What's that town? Bethsaida. Okay? From Bethlehem 
to Bethsaida. Bethsaida, Bethsaida, it's the original hometown of Simon Peter, Andrew, and Philip, three of the 12 apostles. We're told that in John's Gospel, chapter one. What does it mean? Beit Said, Beit Saida, it means house of fishing. Really, the word means more broadly house of hunting for meat to go with bread, in other words, by implication. Got it? And what's this miracle about? Fish and bread. Uh, Beit Saida really means more broadly the way of seeking your answers to the big challenges. So, all these crowds follow Jesus and he welcomes them outside of the house of fishing. He who was born in the house of bread. Okay? And he cures and he preaches and let's see what our king is like. Our king permits interruptions. Isn't that awesome? This king permits interruptions from just kind of the poi polloi. He welcomes and saves people from all backgrounds. A lot of these people in the crowds, they weren't, they weren't like Herod at all. They didn't have that kind of education. They didn't have those kind of houses. But Jesus welcomes them all. And he fully teaches us to hear God's word. Because how are we saved? How are we given life? By the word of God. Are you living in the word of God? Are you living in it? Is it your daily bread every day? I, I pray it is. I, I want to invite you into that as we celebrate the king born in the house of bread. Okay, so our king feeds his people the Lord's banquet, fully satisfying them. He calls his disciples, fallible disciples, to join him in feeding his sheep. Are you a Christian? If you're a Christian, he doesn't call you to sit and watch. He calls you into the ministry. As he says to Peter, you love me? Feed my sheep. Well, that's not just for Peter. That's for everybody who follows him. We're called to get engaged in this ministry of feeding sheep. And he fully feeds and cares for, here's the good news, those who minister for him. Notice this. After everybody in the crowd's fed, they collect the plentiful remnants. And there are, the last word in the Greek of the New Testament here is, is 12, the number 12, dodica. It's, it's the last word in this entire passage I just read. Because you're really emphasizing the Lord Jesus is providing for the 12. Do you get this? And 12 is the number for fullness, fulfillment, and the reconstituted Israel. All that's going on with this, but the basic point is this. If you serve him, he will serve you. If you serve him, he will serve you. You don't have to worry about giving bread away to other people because he's going to give you all the bread you ever need. Got it? Um, that's what's going on there. And all these prophecies are fulfilled. Back to Isaiah chapter 55, verse 2. Why do you spend your money for what is not bread below lechem? Your wages, God says, for what does not satisfy. Truly hear me. Eat what is good and delight your soul in abundance. If you will listen to me, your soul will be fed into eternity. The Lord says, I'm telling you, wake up, people. Now then look at this prophecy from Jesus. Luke 6, 21. Blessed are you who hunger now because you will be satisfied. Same as Isaiah 55. I'll, I'll satisfy you. I really will. Believe me. So Jesus looked up to heaven and said a blessing over them, the loaves and the fish. Now, the standard blessing here, okay, all the way back to Jesus' times, recorded in the Mishnah, it's a standard blessing. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech ha'olam, hamotzi lechem min ha'aretz. That's the Hebrew. I know most of us don't do the Hebrew, but I'm just telling you, let me take you through this. Blessed are you, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu, O Lord our God. 
Melech Ha'olam, king. And the way it's typically going to be translated, if you pull out just kind of Judaism 101, is going to be king of the universe, which is okay. It's not a, it's a decent way of referencing. But let me remind you, Olam means everlasting. The age that was, the age that is, and the age that is to come. First time we see that word in the entire Bible, Genesis 3, it's when God is going to cast Adam and Eve out of the garden because they've eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they will be damned forever into eternity if in their sin they partake of the tree of life. Y'all remember this? And so God says we need to get them out because lest they eat of the tree of life and live olam forever. Now, back to Isaiah 55. Notice this, God makes a promise that he establishes through the Messiah, through the one who comes from David, a berakit olam, an everlasting covenant. Okay, it's the same word here. So in the blessing that Jesus says when he looks up to heaven, he's calling on what is not only the name of his father, but his own name. He's the everlasting king. Are you catching this? Okay. <laughs> this is who he is. He's born as a baby in Bethlehem, but he is the everlasting king. And he brings forth the bread. Hamotzi Lechem, who brings forth the bread. So who's doing it here? Jesus. Get it? He's fulfilling the very blessing that is lifted up to God because he is God on earth. So our king himself provides the bread and the banquet that satisfies. Because he is the king of the universe. He's God's son. He's born in the house of bread. He's doing this outside a house of fish or fishing, which he calls all his disciples to do. He's greater than Moses, far greater. Greater than Elijah, greater than Elisha. But let me ask you this question. In the story that I just read, when did Jesus eat himself? Did you catch that? You didn't catch it. Because we don't hear about him eating, do we? He feeds his people all the way to his disciples who have served the masses. When's he going to eat? This takes us back, of course, to the temptation. The devil said to Jesus, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become what? Like him. Bread. And Jesus answered him, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, earthly bread, but by every word that flows from the mouth of God. Also in the temptation, the devil, this is Luke 4, verses 5 and 6, the devil showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment. To you, I will give all this authority and their power, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. Now, that's a legitimate statement. It's a real temptation because Jesus knows this. During the temporary age that we are in, the devil has this authority. People who are in power, in many cases, maybe all cases, have been given it by the devil. <laughs> that's what was just said. Now, Paul refers to this one as the God of this world. 2 Corinthians 4. Jesus says Satan is the ruler of this world, but that he will be cast out. John 12, verse 21. So you've got to think back to the hierarchy. You've got Satan, and then you've got the people who serve basically under the power of Satan. People like Tiberius, the emperor, the Caesar at this time. It was Augustus when Jesus was born. Now it's Tiberius. Think about our current leaders. Then you got down the, down the list, Herod the first, the great Antipas. Who's your king? To whom do you look and place your hopes for this community, for this nation, for the world? Who are you really working for to get them in power? From whom do I seek my daily bread? and my future. Jesus, the bread of life, feeds us and ultimately 
we will feast with him. That's when he eats in eternity, when he celebrates the big feast with us. Now, to Christmas. This is Augustine. This is the call of what we've been looking at today. Listen to this. Awake mankind. For your sake, God became man. You would have suffered eternal death had he not been born in time. You would have never returned to life had he not shared your death. Let us joyfully celebrate the coming of our salvation and redemption. Celebrate the festive day on which, listen to this, he who is the great and eternal day came from the great and endless day of eternity into our short day of time to save us. Isn't that beautiful? That's Augustine, sermon number 185. So back to what God is saying to us today as we head into the Christmas celebrations. He's come. The bread of life has come and been born in a house of bread. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Have you turned to him? I pray you have. And if you know him as Savior, may this be a day in which you renew that commitment, that repentance, that faith in him. Repent. Seek the Lord. In this day, in this brief day he gives us, when we live here on earth, call on his name, his name, his city, his kingdom, Bethlehem born, our everlasting King Jesus. That's his name. That's the name you want to name. Be saved in his name. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you, and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.